tell you two stories as a way of illustrating how I've been thinking about this. And the first story goes back 34 years, and I was in my first full-time paid role as a teacher. And I was working in a school in West London, I just started. And it was a Saturday morning, and I was driving into London to meet someone. I had a very rickety old car. Some of you remember the Allegro, that we used to call it the Austin All Agro, but I had one of those <laughs> the strange square wheels. And um, the steering wheel, not, not the wheels. <laughs> The illustration doesn't go that far. And, uh, driving into London, and if you know the, the Euston Road, which leads on the underpass before Euston Station, you know that it's three lanes of traffic that turns into two onto the underpass, then three lanes at the other end. Uh, and I was uh, 22. And there was a man in a wheelchair in the middle lane of the three lanes going this way towards the underpass. He was pulling his wheels quite fast, and the traffic was skirting around him as carelessly as it could possibly do so that it wouldn't hit him, but it would also ignore him. And having seen it, I had only one of two choices, to do what everybody else did or to stop. And I stopped and bumped my old Austin Allegro up on the pavement of the double yellow lines in London, which is a dangerous thing to do, jumped out and ran into the middle of the road and talked to him while the traffic is zipping around. And I said to him, where are you going and why are you here? And he said, I'm going to Euston because I need the toilet. So I said, why are you in the middle of the road? And he said, because on the pavement, you have to go up and down, up and down. Whereas here, I just keep going. So I said, but you're very unsafe. And he said, I know that, but I'll get there more quickly. And I thought, I can't leave him. So I pulled him across the road and did the pavement thing and we got there to Euston. And then I thought, well then I can leave him. And he said, no, could you take me to the toilet? So I took him into the toilet and then I thought I could leave him. And he said, no, could you put me on the toilet? So I put him on the toilet and he wanted the door to stay open. He was coming off his wheelchair. And he, he had no legs, so he was a, a clear stump here, and I had to pick him up and maneuver him. And then he said, will you clean me up? Because he couldn't do that for himself. Uh, so I did, and then he asked me to shave him. And in those days, now these very hyper-protected clean days, you can't get the sheer shavers at Euston, but in the old days, you used to be able to pop some money in the wall and the shaver would pop out and you could shave yourself in the men's toilet, but you can't do that now. Everybody worries about getting AIDS and things. But So I popped some money and I popped the shaver and I shaved him. You could do one of those wrong, but never mind. That's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, so uh, this was sort of more or less like an hour and a half. Uh, and then he, I said, can I leave you now? And he said, yes, you can go. And I felt um, very overwhelmed by that experience. Of course, we, you know, you can't clean somebody up and not have a lot of very engaged conversation <laughs> with them. And the journey to, was around about a mile and a bit down to Euston, that's a sort of 25 minute push. And you talk about a lot of things in the course of that time. But I think that for me at 22 was a very shaping experience with a stranger in the fullest sense of the word. So now zoom to two weeks ago and I was in Auckland, New Zealand and I was there with the business and I was there to receive a 24 year old cyclist who had cycled from Paris to uh, New Zealand and he's still cycling, he's on South Island at the moment, uh, he's cycling for water it's a charity we've set up and he's cycling through 20 countries and raising the profile of water issues. And I went to receive him at the last country and it was a wonderful thing to see him after 17 months that he survived the journey on his own to get there. But one of the things we did was uh, our chairman in New Zealand and he decided they would cycle to the Edmund Hillary School. 
Now, Edmund Hillary, as we all remember, was the first man to get to the summit of Everest, 1953, I think it was. And the school is in the area where Edmund Hillary was born and lived. And this was a Maori school. And I've never been amongst the Maori people to such an extent as on this trip. I've been to New Zealand once before, but this trip was a very big eye-opening because it's become acceptable now in mainstream New Zealand white culture that it's important to respect the heritage of the Maori people and to create uh, a response to what are the traditional owned lands of the Maori people by never assuming you can pass through unless you get permission to go through. So you're literally trespassing somebody else's culture and place. And the day before going to the school, where I'll tell the story, we had to go to a Maori temple in Auckland and be received by the aggressor women. Uh, it was quite fascinating. The women come out and the women sing a song of wanting to identify whether your heart and your mind is there to threaten. And if you're there to threaten, of course, you may well get back the robust response of the Maori men. But if the women pick up that you're not there to threaten, they will receive you to come in and a ceremony begins which culminates in the touching of noses. Now you all have seen this before, that you, the Maori people touch noses together. The men embrace by nose, the women embrace by nose, men and women embrace by nose. But it's not just the embrace of the nose, as I learn. It's the common breathing of your air to one another. Now when I tell people this in Western tidy uh, hypodermic culture, <laughs> they immediately go into breathing someone else. All this kind of stuff, and, uh, and they get very protective. And of course, we live in a culture riven with diseases that the NHS cannot possibly pay for nor solve. And, uh, they live in a culture which just gets on disease-free. And there's something quite important about being prepared to absorb each other's stranger reality that protects us, ironically. So after the women had received us and we were then allowed into the temple and the ceremony goes on, we then had the mass pressing of noses to one another. It was really wonderful to do that and I, I loved it and it was a great thing to experience, to participate in, but then to translate that to a primary school now you know how little children can smell <laughs> and be sometimes. Um, let's be honest about it. Not easy. And in this school, the Edmund Hillary School, the children come from some of the most tortured, broken, poor, desperate, and violent Maori communities that you could imagine. None of the children had shoes, multiple children had fractures on their heads and faces. There were cuts across the faces and cuts on the necks. These were the results of home violence and attack to one another. This is the consequence of a culture that is not yet resolved and sorted, but is trying to come to terms with what are now the majority whites of New Zealand. And we went in, and because of who I was, there was a receiving group of three girls and two boys in front of the 200 young married children. And they're all sitting on the floor. And we're all there in our suits, apart from our cyclists who's in the cycling gear. And these children begin to express their welcome. And my response to each child is to go up and to press noses and breathe their air and then sit down, and the next one will be pressed noses and breathe the air. The last one, a little nine-year-old boy, I'll never forget it, he said, I want to welcome Michael John Hastings. I went, oh, how did he know my middle name? And of course, he did his thing, and when he did his thing, he said, I am so happy to receive someone who's met the Queen. I'm thinking, why does it matter to him 
that I've met the Queen. He's a little Maori boy in a very broken community in the base of Auckland. And that matters. Why does that matter? So when it was all over, of course, I went up and I pressed noses and we breathed air together and sat down. And when the whole thing was finished, I went up to talk to him. So first of all, how did you know my middle name? He said, because I've researched you on the internet. I know everything about you. <laughs> <laughs> Not bad for a nine-year-old. Uh, and then I said, why did you mention about the Queen? And he said, because, because I need to have hope that people like you will know people I want to hope in, and that gives me hope. I thought, wow, this boy is profound. <laughs> At nine, he's figured out that actually we all need iconic people around us. We all need to think that somebody else can connect us, that there is a way through. What did I learn in both experiences? That I learned two things. So uh, yesterday was my older son's wedding, and uh, so I'm a bit bleary-eyed today. It was a long day, a long night. <laughs> Um, and uh, he's 13, got married, and it's wonderful. But um, I had to do the sermon yesterday in, the, in the, the wedding service, and that was a great treat. And I quoted from Louis de Bernier's um, Captain Corelli's Mandolin. Many of you know the book. And you know that there is a section in the book where uh, de Bernier describes what love is. And he says that love is what is left over when being in love has burnt away. He says any fool can be in love, but not any fool can love. Do you see the difference? And I think the choice uh, to choose to receive the uncomfortable <coughs> presence of the stranger, particularly in our hypodermic culture, they must be whitewashed to such clarity. And amongst the Maoris, yet alone also amongst the homeless man of Euston, the need to take whatever the stranger brings for the angelic value of the person. Many people have said to me in the years since about that man, do you believe he was human or spiritual? And I believe to be spiritual is to be human, and to be human is to be spiritual. He was both. Was he an angel? Well, in the Bible there is a description that angels come, and the presence of Jesus can come, and the presence of any spiritual leader can come unawares in physical form. But what that did for me was to teach me not to be afraid and to receive. Uh, that's my reflection on this. Thank you.